my name is Greg Madison, and this is the second episode of The Living Process. This time, my guest is Ken Bradford. Uh, Ken is very well known in the existential psychotherapy world. He's also very well known as a Dzogchen Buddhist teacher. And in this conversation, we talk not only about his background in both of those traditions and how they go together for him, but also a correspondence that he had with Eugene Gendlin uh, in the early 1980s for about five years. And Ken generously showed me some of the letters he still has from that conversation. And it's very interesting the way the two of them have such similar interests in openness and other aspects of focusing as it was still being developed then and how that crossed with Ken's interest in Buddhism and later his interest in existential psychotherapy when he studied with James Bujenthal and uh, ended up co-teaching with him. And you'll see that our conversation is really quite far-ranging and I think uh, touches on some interesting topics. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Here's Ken Bradford. So, you know, dipping back into my my file mm -hmm. um, has been really valuable for me. Dipping back into, into the the philosophics and practicalities of Gene's thought. And I'm finding it um, very relevant and helpful for what I'm doing now, which is basically um, Dharma-centric um, rather than psychotherapy-centric, which has been the course of you know 30, the 30 some previous years. Um, so what I've my shift in a nutshell is I have accessed uh, the Buddha Dharma in the service of therapy, but now it's reversed. I'm accessing therapy, and particularly I, I'm feeling like the focusing sensibility is especially useful in being um, of service to a, to a greater awakening to the Dharma. Um, and so this has really been good for me. You're reaching out. Great. So I want to just welcome you and um, just say how grateful I am that we're doing this. Um, maybe we want to start there. I was going to start with kind of a bit more of the history, but let's start with the present and work our way back. I'm curious what, going back into Gene's thought and your acquaintance with him, what it's doing for you now. I'm curious about that. Well, there's multiple levels with that. Okay. You know, this is a correspondence that began in, in 1981 and lasted until, based on my stuff, I think, until 1986, 87. Okay. Um, he came out to Berkeley in 1980, the fall of 1980 now, 43 years ago and taught focusing to us himself Ooh, okay and uh at a at a buddhist institute the nima institute where i was a student at the time and so um i remember john wellwood do you know mm -hmm. wellwood yeah right so wellwood was there kind of as an apprentice he wasn't really he was doing like a little support teaching so um it totally resonated with me and i just thought well this is a, this is a, this is now a therapy i could do at the time i wasn't sure whether i was going to be a buddhist scholar or a monk or a therapist or anything and it was really pivotal in terms of showing me that i could do an ex experience near therapy that was helpful to others but also nourishing mm -hmm. in the doing of it mm -hmm. meditative it was it was inherently meditative and yeah. so that's what i'm Reappreciating in going back uh, to focusing now that there's something that Gene was attuned to and reaching for 
that is totally contemporary, totally mm-hmm. cutting edge, even today. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like it was that similarity in style with the Buddhism that was kind of the center of your learning at that time, at least, and has continued to be, it sounds like, in some ways, that both focusing and the Buddhism as practices had this contemplative, meditative center to them. Exactly. As practices. Yeah. So I would say less Buddha, Buddhism or less the Dharma than yeah. meditation. That's the common ground there with okay. this with this stipulation that with focusing, it's really fo- uh, addressing the, the particular problems, mm-hmm. the specific problems that come up for us. Whereas you know, the Dharma goes for, you know, the full Monty. <laughs> <laughs> and in doing so is at risk of spiritual bypassing. Okay. Of weeping over the particular problems that snag people uh, their entire lives. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. it would be in that dimension of practice that it was useful to me and opened a way back then. And um, recognizing is useful to me now in terms of how to introduce people to the non-dualistic dharma, the so-called higher dharmas, or more essential teachings, in a way that is integrative that is on the inside rather than um, chased, approached. Can you say more about that? I'm curious. About well, you mm-hmm. you know, Greg, I'm just I'm just kind of thinking this through. Yeah, good. On the fly now. In yeah. in, in in general, it would be. Um, Settling, to begin with, settling in uh, calming the system down and getting into the body, into the physical body, what we would say in uh, Buddhist psychology, also the subtle body, the energy body, and in addition, the mind, mental body. Mm -hmm. So the vocabulary is a bit different. Um, but it has to be it has to be rooted uh, definitely in well, I guess we could just say physical and emotional body because all of those defense structures we have, all the little ways we cope, we manage to cope and then become <clears throat> slaves to our successful coping strategies, mainly as kids, right? Um, we can't get free of those things. And in fact, we're terrified of dropping our shields and being nakedly open in the world, which is the path of, of the Dharma, the heart path. Uh, it involves meditation, but mm-hmm. in essence, it's not about meditation. It's also not about distraction. And so the reason that we have to open up our holdings and our what we want to call them our repressions or dissociations whatever language you want to use to talk about how we're holding ourselves together we have to release on that other uh, otherwise it the dharma won't work we won't approach even begin to approach what the buddha realized when he dropped his shields yeah so let me say that back to you the way I'm getting it, because it sounds really interesting to me, that the first step is to drop down into the body, um, not just the physical body, but the kind of the energetic emotional body, whatever you call that. First of all, dropping down there and probably quite quickly finding what is already, um, you might say, almost lodged there through patterning or through defending or previous experience, whatever it is, you quite quickly find something there. 
But I think what you're suggesting is that what you find in the body as what could be sort of personal concerns, felt senses or whatever, can actually be a doorway to something much bigger. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, so the way that I've detailed it in the, uh, in the book I wrote a couple years ago is first calming down yeah. and then tuning in mm -hmm. and then deepening. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that comes from the sophistication of psychology, of experiencing your therapy, depth therapy. Yeah. And so all of that is congruent. But then there's the, the linchpin difference of then seeing who's tuning in, who's deepening, mm -hmm. and, letting, and letting the observer and the observed split collapse. Yeah, that is that I'm very interested in that because that takes the what sounds like focusing up until now. Now you're going into different territory. I'm very curious about that. You know what's uh, you know what's extremely cool here is the correspondence Gene and I were having in the '80s. He is speaking right to this. I mean, it was my interest, mm -hmm. but he was really leading the correspondence uh, in talking about the uh, openness, mm -hmm. something more. There's always something more. You can have um, felt, you go into your felt sensing, which is mission critical. Whatever you want to call it, felt sensing, felt intelligence, non-conceptual awareness, mm -hmm. you open up and then something happens. And sometimes it's like this felt shift, like something really, mm -hmm. something really shifts and open. You can feel it. It's not just, uh, self understanding, but it's an energetic, yeah, realignment, better alignment. Um, and so he was talking about the openness that's required for that, you know, back in the 80s, which is the same language I'm using here in the, in the 2020s. So let me ask about that, because we had a little bit of a correspondence, and I think the word openness and the word I was using, which was space, but sometimes I use openness, I think we're talking about the same thing, I think. Um, but if I get what both you and Gene were corresponding about, it's noticing that there's quite a radical... Um, I'm not sure this, well, this may be the wrong way of saying it, but quite a radical disidentifying with self in order to actually open up to the process in the way that the process really needs you to open up. And then you have this curious question of what am I then? Is there an I here? Is there a self here? I remember having a little conversation with Gene at one point, and he said, well, if there is a self at all, it's an ising self. It's like process self in some way. But I'm wondering, what, where do you take that? Yeah, right. He, he's, yeah, we're on the same, we're totally on the same page. Yeah, so this so, uh, yeah, so openness, there's a kind of a, um, what, a, uh, preliminary openness, where we open for a moment, we open a little bit, and even a little bit, though, can change everything, we can... Ah, settle. Yeah. And then something can come up. But also, it could be understood as the bottom falling out, where it's a kind of a definitive opening 
um, rather than um, proximal or something. Mm -hmm. And so then words like groundlessness, openness, groundlessness, emptiness, um, decenteredness, mm -hmm. all of these begin to make sense because we release on those reference points that that have this feedback loop that I exist. Yeah. We're constantly doing this feedback loop. And that should be a clue right away that we have to keep it up because if we don't keep up this self-talk, sometimes it's, it's not even fully conceptual. It can be like pre-conceptual kind of a just like, you know, thinking, referencing something out there which validates there is a, a stable self ground in here so i can be like secure and safe and so of course this is a fabrication you say construct yeah i just as you say that i can feel my body responding and it feels um exhilarating and um I, I was gonna it's not anxious but it's apprehensive it's like what will happen if if the bottom drops out and there's nothing to hold on to um i'm curious about that i'm curious about the therapeutic value of that maybe or because i'm thinking i want to go there but not everybody does no and um maybe not everybody can or should that's i guess that's a question to you right yeah uh, in these waters particularly in these waters a person's capacity for being present, mm -hmm. not preoccupied with the past or the future, but in the timeless present is essential. It's essential in, in a dharma. I keep stressing this. You have to be honest with yourself. What can you, what can you handle? And so the, this critical quality of capacity, and I would just make open a new window for a moment. In Buddhism, there's many paths depending on where somebody's at, particularly over the course of several centuries, and especially in Tibet, a lot of unique practices like tantric practices and so forth developed weren't there at the beginning. Well, because in the beginning, people weren't prepared. There were there was there was no Buddhist, uh, no Buddhists exist. Only and you see this in the life of the Buddha himself, as people became more adept at being settled in themselves, then he could teach them more direct teachings, such as the famous Heart Sutra. Emptiness is form. Form is emptiness. So. With the correspondence with gene, for instance, and what we're talking about, we make a different distinction between openness or groundlessness and then self-groundedness. So at some point, you see that actually there is there is no difference, which is one another way of saying that groundedness is an illusion and that groundlessness is an illusion. So when I throw that out, right, like this is more complex mm -hmm. this is more uh challenging so we'll close that window now um we have to see what's our capacity for tolerating i would say like heidegger the mystery yeah groundlessness and so that has two components as you're already saying there is being willing and able. How much are we willing and able to open ourselves? So the willing is simply our interest. Some people aren't interested, as you say. In fact, most people, by far. 
<laughs> just aren't interested. They're interested in their day to day and, you know, what happened last week and what they're going to do tomorrow and how they're going to pay the rent and all this stuff, right? So they're not interested in the bigger picture. And that's the kind of thing like you either are or you aren't. As far as I can tell, that that's just there. And if you aren't, well, okay. But if you are, then the other component comes in, which is ability. So being, you're, you're willing, okay, but are you able? Some people are very able, but they're not interested. Yeah. Okay, well, they're not going to go then. Some people are interested, even desperately interested, in, in changing and getting out of their claustrophobic world, self-world, yeah. right? But they don't have the ability. So this is where focusing just basically opened an enormous door. I, that's the way I see it. And all of these other experience near disciplines that have developed in the last 40 years um, might really owe something to this practical innovation that Gene in particular developed, I guess with Carl Rogers to some extent, on uh, how do you because you can develop your ability you can train your mind to not be so distracted and to focus yeah yeah so in so my that, in my example then the way through for me would be because my first response was this uh apprehension and I can't remember the other word I used, but it was a kind of excitement. Yeah, exhilaration. I, exhilaration, exactly. My way through would be to start with that, to open up to that and give it enough space that it then carries me someplace further. Is that right? I really feel that way, going with that sense that you just identified that, complexity mm -hmm. right as gene would talk of it the implicit mm -hmm. complexity because it hasn't you know it's just kind of hovering right now it's just kind of there you know i really feel this has a lot this is a really powerful way to go rather than through something in buddhist psychology that go from the inside out begin with a queasy feeling or this, this mixed feeling that you have and then like just really focusing style just opening up to that mm -hmm. but it does help to have a pointer a target yeah and a reassurance that it's okay to drop the shields and and opening okay so we want to we want to tune in, sense, feeling, felt, sensing. Um, and then it's okay to relax into that unformed space. So apprehension, exhilaration, both together, let them, yeah, so let them both together. Kind mm -hmm. of, okay, yes. And then let them be. What because something will happen. Yeah. The thing that I notice as I as I'm listening to you, I'm doing it slightly. Um, the thing that I notice for me is um how good it feels to pay attention to this felt sense that I have that I've I've used a couple of words, but I know it's more than those words. The thing, though, that is most interesting to me, or maybe maybe most satisfying to me at the moment that might change, is not actually the felt sense. It's the space that opens up when I pay attention to it. It's like when I pay attention to this felt sense, it's like my experience of myself expands. And that already is a payoff in some way. Now, do you feel that the felt, well, there's felt sense, you had a couple words, and there's felt sensing. Mm -hmm. 
do you feel that the felt sensing is different from the larger, more open? For me, the felt sensing needs that larger um, for me to actually be able to be with all of it. Otherwise, I feel like I'm paying attention to a more constrained manifestation of it from a smaller self. But it feels very different if I'm with this felt sense or felt sensing from this larger. And the larger comes quite just, it, it, it almost like it bounces off the felt sense and creates this space that's big enough that I can be with it and sensing this larger sense of myself at the same time. That to me is something that sometimes we miss in focusing, but feels very satisfying to me. And I'm wondering if might, it might be a little bit closer to what you're adding. It's right online. Exactly yeah. that. Exactly that. That the natural well-being. Yeah. Of being present. Yes, exactly. Which mm. ironically comes when I pay attention sometimes to a some a problem. <laughs> the natural well-being of being present is actually what I go, oh, that's nice. So this is really important. And I in rereading these notes from 1981, it was like being within the throneness. Mm-hmm is is the openness so we'll make we can make a distinction between personal stuff and the big open mm -hmm. well in experience you realize oh these aren't That's separate it. the problem the issue the tightness yes. in tuning into that it opens up into this into what's been there all along yeah exactly but it got truncated. It got it yeah. got reified into a knot. Yeah, a reaction, a tension of some kind. And so then, in the non-dual approach, the the direct approach, the the heart of the Dharma is let go there, let be. So re so in the openness. There's the permission to relax mm -hmm. and let the presence just stabilize. Even if it's for a second, that's good. If it's for 10 seconds, even better. A minute, better still. Half hour, now we're talking. Because then these radiances of being, lucidities, uh, begin to emerge. So these are, this is the pointers that we have in this more advanced dharma. That two kind of things happen. One is the knots, our psychological knots, repressions, unwind. They can, and then we discover that they have to, they always unwind. They want to unwind. Yeah, exactly. Because because we're holding them together. And when we stop holding, then things release. Hmm. And so when the Buddha decided to actually stop meditating, people don't really get that. But he, for seven years, he was a very hard, tough meditator, renunciate. And then he realized he hit a wall. It wasn't working. So he stopped. And he sat under this tree. But those seven years were not wasted because he had strengthened his concentration, his one-pointedness. So then he could relax that. And when he relaxed that, everything came up. They call it the Maras, like mm -hmm. lust. I mean, lust is the favorite one, but also anger, but also all kinds of things, shame, mm -hmm. um, imp imperiousness, whatever our kind of stuff is you know all of that shadow material what Jung would say all that stuff comes up and they and then but then if you do nothing you don't give them energy but you don't block them they just 
lift naturally. Now there might be a, a more deeply ingrained habit pattern, so that they'll come. They'll come back. That's what I find. Um, so it has to, you know, there's deeper releasing that's required. But the pointers in the Dharma that go beyond psychology, go beyond focusing, um, is this letting be in openness. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder if um, focusing, if you practice focusing over decades, if it quite naturally starts to bring you to this which is almost like a blending with the kind of practice that you're talking about i i think it could i think gene is a case study <laughs> in this um only you have to be prepared to not focus so I be focusing, and then at some point you don't. You let go. You let go of a focus, and so that um, whatever the issue was, and really it, it's organic in the practice, in the process of felt sensing. It becomes an ising, mm -hmm. and it, if we let it. So can I just ask, so those many years ago when you were corresponding with Jean, was your concern the same or did he have a slightly different angle on it? Because for some reason, it seems like you went in a slightly different direction. I'm wondering if, if it, there wasn't enough to it for you or... Um, it was incredibly vital. He was working something out where he was in his life and career. And I was trying to, I was beginning in mine. Mm -hmm. So we were at different places, but we were focusing on the same concern. Um, but then a couple, a couple of things happened. One, I had to make a living. He already had a living. He didn't have to worry. <laughs> he was tenured. <laughs> so he could play in the, you know, with the focusing world. That was not, I wouldn't want to say it was a side project for him, but you know, he had paychecks coming regularly, no matter what he did. I did not. And I had my um I had a child at that point in time in the uh, in the mid 80s and i was poor so i had to get a gig going hmm. and so uh focusing was was spot on it was working for me but then i fell in with uh, jim bugenthal and his what ex existential humanistic style very experienced near and that showed me a way to do the to do therapy with uh, uh, with a dexterity, with it with nuance in terms of the relationship, in terms of working with content and process. He had this sophisticated thing figured out. He was now at, older than Gene. He had already worked this out in this incredible book of his, "The Art of the Psychotherapist." And so that artistry um, captured me. And so then I was able to move forward in developing a career in California um, by working with Jim. And I could use the focusing in the therapy. It was implicit. And Jim understood this without having the same, you know, the various steps. Mm -hmm. He totally was down. With the process it's the same process yeah only more uh, in his style more more um spontaneous and interactive yeah that would be good to talk about a bit i'm just noticing that at that time there wouldn't have been a focusing oriented therapy 
program that you could have taken but it sounds exactly. like you 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 found a program that was open enough that you could bring with you what you had got from focusing and you made it into a kind of a focusing oriented existential therapy in some ways you know they just yeah came they just came together and so given that you know i have to make a li- get my education make a living pass the licensing exam you know and like all these all these domestic things it was like i couldn't do it all and yeah. so i let go of focusing i also let go of uh, buddhism and the dharma mm-hmm. because i was focusing on my life but then when i came but then i came back to the dharma which as we're talking about goes beyond focusing so that was more compelling to me and and then i also had the uh, incredible good fortune of falling in with a, a, a pretty realized master, a Zok, a Zok Chen master. I had already fallen in with him when I met Gene, but I was, um, but I could see that that had a, a potentiality to it. Hmm. You know, it just, there's nothing beyond. Um, the, the immediacy of a, of stabilized presence. So I went that way, and then I, and then I left them. Um, I left the focusing fold. So that was before the the uh, focusing oriented therapy yeah. uh, was developed. So um, I would like to get back to where you are now. Um, and what's captivating you or interest your biggest interest now but before just to talk a bit about therapy because um i think people sometimes think of the focusing process as something that you would do almost step by step in some way within a therapeutic session and most people including myself would quite seamlessly weave felt sensing moments of felt sensing into the back and forth relationship the interaction in the room the dialogue that's happening also the therapist keeping one eye on their own sort of embodied responses and sort of checking what that information is telling them about the client about the interaction about themselves and how much of that maybe could be shared so I, th- I I'm guessing that more nuanced version of integrating a focusing sensibility into all the other things that happen in therapy might be a little bit closer to what you ended up developing. Is that, that really? Right? It really sounds like it. Yeah. 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 So there's there's a, a attunement to the inner subjective field. Yeah that is in the dimension of felt sensing now i use i use vocabulary like like attunement but it it's all pointing to the same openness mm-hmm. but but felt openness not vacuous not void but cog, cognizant that is is non-conceptual but could also be conceptual the concepts could you know pop out here and there but the the big difference and it's probably true for focusing oriented therapy it certainly was for what i did is that you don't give that a lot you don't follow that too far unless the person really needs to nail down an understanding and then you then the emphasis is on understanding exper- experience. But that's not as robust as understanding the experience and experiencing the understanding. So the I would privilege 
the experiencing of the understanding the felt which is felt sensing yeah so what i'm taking from that is the client might have a moment of understanding and there could be a shift there and there could be some satisfaction that they realized something freshly or more deeply but there's also at the same time there is the experience of the understanding itself that it it's a an energetic shift in some way that isn't isn't completed actually in the understanding it continues somehow exactly so this is i see this as the biggest difference between psychology and i guess we could say spirituality although that word is tricky means too much um psychology wants to nail down wants to come to an understanding and then great a shift now i see myself at a better perspective i can put the past in better perspective i'm a little freer in my body now also something has freed up and so i'm i'm finished with that and i'm gonna now be the new me <laughs> going forward <laughs> Whereas the more spiritual approach says, okay, but don't take it so seriously because it's going to change too. Yeah. There's, the, there's, a, there's a tacit understanding that nothing is real in the sense of reified, solidified, concrete. Everything is mm -hmm. in transit, is fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it, it's like that moment of understanding is also an opportunity to notice um, that it's kind of what it's all about in a way. Yeah. So the so the key the key difference is rather than noticing the shift, notice the noticer of the shift. So the way you say that, I'm wondering if you've got something more there than the way I say it. I, I want to ask you, when you notice the noticer, what's there? What's there for you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> the question, isn't it? <laughs> like it's hard to nail it down. And yet, there's cognizance there's lucidity yeah there's no self we can pinpoint and if we do it'll change anyway um but it doesn't mean that we're lacking intelligence that we're that we're that we're going into any kind of some kind of a void mm -hmm. yeah and so so the emphasis in the heart of the dharma would be to become more friendly and familiar uh, with the openness. So I'm wondering if we're getting close to what your your current interest is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so we're we're doing it <laughs> in a way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the way that I would say that if i've understood you is um something receives the shift it the shift if you have a bodily shift if you're felt sensing and the body shifts and there's a new understanding potentially that comes maybe there is no new understanding there's a shift that's so without words that you never really understand it but it's still a shift whatever happens somehow it's received by something it's like it's witnessed it's noticed it's held it's um yeah and and so then that feeling of contentment of well-being we would say comes up but i think what you're noticing it, we could say comes up but it also is always there we're, tu we're tuning into something that's bigger yeah that we're inside of but we don't always notice it in fact we hardly ever do yeah yes and un unnecessary 
for for many people unnecessarily small yeah it's com- more comfortable more familiar yes but it's um you know Jean made a comment in one of these letters that really stopped me. Um, he's, he wrote to me that he goes, most people have given up on themselves and they look for something else. And he put that in caps, other. Hmm. And I think that selling ourselves short, like being keeping it small and unnecessarily our awareness unnecessarily small is a, is a one way that we inadvertently mm-hmm. without intending to mm-hmm. kind of give up on ourself but ourself not as we see it as i think that's really good what you're doing i totally am with you on that it's a there's a circularity a self narrative that we're all what yeah. we're inside so letting that breathe, letting that become permeable and letting it just break, then we realize something else. We could say, oh, we make a space, but really it's more like we recognize mm-hmm. a space and that our awareness is that space. Yeah. And that space is unconfined, open. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at. It you, there is no, you well, at least I can't find the edge of it. Yeah, see, now this is what when we speak of authenticity. This, I think, is, is, is mature authenticity. What Heidegger got to, not in the early years when he was talking about resol- being resolute, and that was a trap. <laughs> and, and he succumbed to the whole Nazi thing. But then later in his life, then it was something like being in re- releasement, this yeah. gloss and height thing. Yeah. Natural, naturally released though. It's not something we do. Mm-hmm. It's something like we recognize. And then the question beyond psychology would be how to just rest without yeah. feeling like we've got to improve anything. Yeah. We've got to correct anything. But let being be as we're part of it. And then becoming becoming more settled in spacious awareness. Yeah, uh, I, as you say that, I I feel like even though there is probably many other reasons for it, I feel like I can understand why you might go from practicing as an existential therapist to back to the Dharma. That there's something more well i'm tempted to say less constraining in it is that your experience less less constraining and more fertile in the sense of allowing for greater uh, potentiality both in terms of not being constrained not being um stuck on one position or another being for or against things allowing that to be more fluid but then also allowing for these natural capacities to radiate more unimpeded because how would it look right how would i look if i just let myself be spontaneous Mm -hmm. in a in attunement to this is where language becomes a little queasy here in attunement to our inner guidance inner compass Mm. felt sensing the enlightened intent of being this is something that comes in the higher tantras this suddenly appears there is such thing as enlightened intent 
which we can be in accord with or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is where, where Bugenthal would talk about the thrust toward authenticity, which is what he felt. And I feel that I find this, I found the same thing, that there's something in me that wants to be true, mm -hmm. like an arrow flies true. Yeah. And not off to one side or the other, to be in in sync with whatever this thing it's hard to talk about is. Um, and that rightness, that kind of, I don't even know if it's transcendent. I really don't. I'm, I'm not sure it is. I think it's within the throneness. Uh, there is this, there's space, but there's also cognizance. There's also luc there's, there's lucidity. Mm -hmm. And so letting the radiances of our lucidity, compassion, knowing, bliss, all of those expressions, mm -hmm. um, Letting those have more room to roam. So, these... yeah, it sounds like you haven't lost the psychology. Psychology is intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, you, when it's relevant, it's there. Yeah. And then you know it doesn't have to, we don't have to. We don't have to, you know, shackle ourselves to it. Yeah, exactly. Because it's always about something. Psychology is always about either it's a person or a mental event, a mental object, or something. Yeah, that takes place in a, a vaster space, a vaster openness, and that openness has its own intelligence. Um, which isn't different from psychological intelligence, mm -hmm. but it's it's just more inclusive. Yeah, it it sounds to me it's almost like uh, this term psychology and this term spirituality they're quite arbitrary. It's not it's not lived in that separate way. But you can put the emphasis on one side or the other, but they're both always there. Right. That's right. Yeah, so this was part of this correspondence that I was having with Gene in the 80s. That they're both they're both there. There's the openness and there's the there's the personal concerns. Mm -hmm. And even back then he was saying the point isn't to commute. That was his word between the two of them. But really, to recognize um, that they're basically the same process or the same something. I don't even know what he would say about that. That it's within thrownness that we discover openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. It's, I mean, <clears throat> for those of us, that have kind of been in the focusing world for a while, it's clear, even while Gene was alive, he used to make it very clear that um, he really would skirt around anything too spiritual. Spirituality was something that he, I think he was very, probably personally very open to. Um, but in terms of what he would say to all of us, I think he was just so concerned that we would take anything he said as more content that we should take on board. And I think he wouldn't have wanted that. So he said very little. I think you probably got more out of him <laughs> all those years ago than many of us ever did. Yeah, I think that really speaks to his integrity. Yeah. That, that he was really focused on genuine opening yeah. rather 
from the inside out rather than conceptual reference systems. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had basically the same conversation with the the poet um, Gary Snyder. He lives near me. He's 93 now. He yeah. came over for dinner and so we had this fabulous talk. And um, he wanted to take down the some of the Dzogchen books. He liked uh, he didn't really hasn't really studied Dzogchen. He's a Zen guy, right? Yeah. And so he was fascinated with what I was presenting. And so he's taking down some of the book titles and he, he gave me a couple of his books. He signed a couple of books and gave them to me. But then as he left, he said, Oh, but it's just more it's just more words. You know, he's a man of letters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was and he was also clear. It's like, you know, oh, this is a trap. <laughs> it's yeah, if you can use the words to generate an opening and then put the words away. But we get so enamored with the words, I think. We do. And and we use them as defenses. Yeah. This is what I think Winnicott understood. And he kind of hinted at it with the transitional phenomena, that we have our transitional object as a baby, right? And then we get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And so American psychology, developmental psychology will say, well, yeah, because we don't we don't need it anymore. We're going on that noble, righteous path to separation and individuation. But Winnicott was not so enamored of that. And he understood that transitional phenomena, you never actually make it across to your island of self-solidity. Mm -hmm. That that blanket, that stuffed animal becomes language. Yeah. And there's no end to language. And so being in the space, in the tran in the transit, is where the smart money goes. And it's where also where the, the emphasis shifts in, in terms of certainly Dzogchen, but also many of these non-dualistic uh, traditions. That we gain access to the open, but then the practice becomes rather different. Then it's habituating because we are creatures of habit. And the thing will be, what is it we're going to habituate to? And so then becoming more familiar, getting more used to the openness. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can do that, then from the Buddhist perspective, the more we live in, in um, natural wakefulness. Bodhi. Let me ask you one last thing. Um, well, maybe two. <laughs> one is um, just picking up with what you were just saying. I'm wondering what what your next development is or kind of where you're headed now. Well, um, I'm, a, I'm basically a Dharma teacher now. Okay. Now I'll still do I'll still do things for psychologists. And it does turn out that London and that larger environment where you are is more interested in this um, really going beyond psychology. What we're talking about now, we go we say going beyond it, but it comes along with us. Yeah. It's not it's not that we abandon yeah. the knowledge of our defense mechanisms and this and that and the third thing but that moving moving more into naked awareness awakened natural presence unconstructed that's more what i'm doing now and so i'm going to start i'm going to do now another zok chen retreat i did one a, a couple uh like eight nine years ago and then i stopped because i felt i was mm, overextending myself and i needed to integrate it better 
And it turns out uh, I, I probably have enough that I can that I can be trusted <laughs> with offering this uh, these incredibly delicate teachings. So I'm going to be doing that. That's coming right up in a few weeks. Another retreat here in California. But if through this that you've opened up for us here, uh, for, I think I'm going to be introducing more of this felt sensing mm -hmm. to these these uh, dharma practitioners, these meditators. Um, so that's kind of the cutting edge for me just now. That would be interesting. Um, I will put at the end your website so people can find you if you know if they want to find out more about what you're doing because it sounds really interesting and i'm sure people will be interested okay um and i, I notice that you're working with psychologists i'm wondering do you think um some of the insights or sensitivities in what you're working on working with presenting sharing if that has wider uh, applications, I'm just thinking of the state of the world at the moment and whether what you're offering has more even general public applicability in some way. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I think I think it definitely has applicability in this in the sense that as more people actually practice, and I'm talking practice as we're talking about it, opening up in a felt sensing mode and then keeping going, tolerating the openness, more and more undefended presence, more and more, which opens the heart. And so it allows for ways, allows for different kinds of compassion, including conversational compassion with people who are different than us, who have maybe tighter, more violent, opinionated or something, to how to create bridges between that. But my sense is that it's grassroots and that one person at a time. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm modest. I don't extend it beyond that. But since we're talking to psychologists here, I will say that I spent 30 years, or at least 25 years, of, of, trying, of introducing existential psychologists in particular on both sides of the pond, this Dharma stuff. And normally people are very interested. Mm -hmm. But I can't come to the realization that they don't practice. They practice therapy. <laughs> and for many of us, therapy is our spiritual practice because then, as you're talking, we're felt sensing too. Yeah. We're opening our heart and our belly and everything and resonating and being willing to be broken open mm -hmm. by the other. Mm -hmm. That's when our experience near therapy has that courage. Yeah. That you're really willing to be crashed into. Yeah. By that other, and then work with that mess. So I think that's well, that has a lot of integrity to do that. But you also have to practice on your own, you know, meditatively in some way or another. And so I'm not sure how interested. I think the psychologists have the ability. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not always sure how interested they are in really just living with shields down. Mm -hmm. Shields down in the session, okay, but even then, you're still in charge of the session. Yeah. <laughs> so, but living more openly, um, I wonder about that. So, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Greg. It's always a uh, Good to talk to you. And I really like that we got this extended time, just you and me, to get to know each other and yeah, collaborate too. a bit more. Yeah, I found it really uh, inspiring and 
uh, I feel a, some enthusiasm for something that I can't name yet. <laughs> so are you happy for this to be available for people to look at? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And let's let's keep in contact. Let's do, Greg. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.